Thank you very much. It's actually, I think it's the first time I introduced Cecilia to a meeting and, and it's, it's kind of fun, of course, because Cecilia has been working with me for 13 years. Um, she actually, actually came to the lab a day in, in uh, I think it was May uh, 2007, when we celebrated our, our paper in Nature Cell Biology, showing that exosomes carry and shuttle RNA between cells. So she got introduced to the lab with champagne and, and candy. Uh, Cecilia has, has uh, pursued her interest in uh, extracellular vesicles over, over the last 13 years with, with great uh, intensity, I would say, uh, and curiosity. And she calls herself even an exosome nerd sometimes, which I really think is a good thing when you want to understand the intricacies of extracellular vesicles. And we should, I should tell everybody here that something that you probably don't know, and that is that Cecilia is a world champion. Uh, and she's a world champion in figure skating. And, and being a world champion in, in figure skating for teams, I should say. And being a figure, being a world champion in anything means, even team, it means you have, are, are meticulous and hardworking like, like few. So uh, that's, that's one of the characteristics of, of Cecilia, I would say. She's not prepared for me saying this, perhaps, but uh, so she's been in the lab since uh, 2007. She's uh, helped get the MOOC or was chairing the MOOC 2000, 2016. And she also did a postdoc with Uchiha, Dr. Uchiha in, at the National Cancer Center in Tokyo back in 2015. So uh, Cecilia, thanks for letting me introduce you. Uh, and welcome to Web EV Talk. And you're going to talk about one of our, both our favorite topics, which is diversity and subpopulations of extracellular vesicles. Cecilia. Uh, thank you, Jan, for uh, that uh, kind introduction. And uh, thank you uh, both Jan and Carolina for inviting me today. Thank you, Jan, for uh, dropping the world champion. <laughs> Um, that's a great start. And yeah, you were right. On my first lab meeting in the group, we had champagne. So uh, I, I thought it was a great group to join. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about subpopulations of extracellular uh, vesicles. And in the 40s and 60s, it was found that in plasma, uh, there were some particles that were pro-coagulant, but were not part of the cells that have this pro-coagulant factor. And it was later found that these were small vesicles that could be pelleted from, from serum. So then later in the 70s, it was also found vesicles in the prostatic fluid and the seminal fluid. And these were referred to as prostosomes. And then maybe the two papers that most people know the best that came in the early 80s, uh, that showed the release of the transferrin receptor as part of small vesicles uh, released from the multicellular body. And since these early work, uh, a lot of studies have been published, and I think almost there are as many names of the vesicles as there are studies. So some people have uh, named their vesicles based on the biogenesis. Some have named them based uh, on their size, other depending on which cell that released them. Some have done it based on what the vesicles do, uh, what they look like, or some uh, name them based on how they isolate them. So we have a lot of names circulating around and it's sometimes hard to figure out whether we're working on the same vesicles or not. But I think uh, after the Paris meeting in 2011 and also uh, the um, first ISO meeting in Gothenburg in 2012, we started to thinking that maybe we should call them extracellular vesicle as a common name, and then mostly been focusing on three different subpopulations of vesicles. And this is then based on their uh, biogenesis. And uh, we have the apoptotic bodies, that are released from cells that are dying and they're usually uh, the largest. And then we have the microvesicles that are budding off from the plasma membrane and they are intermediate in size. And then we have the uh, exosomes that are formed through inward budding of the multicellular body. And then when that fuses with the plasma membrane, 
these interluminal vesicles are released. But of course, the sizes are overlapping, and once they are released into the extracellular space and we are isolating them, it's hard for us to know which one uh, we're working with. So I would like to uh, suggest here that there are many, many more subpopulations of vesicles than just these biogenesis one. And as John said, uh, subpopulations of vesicles are, are both uh, for us uh, favorites topics. So some of you might recognize this uh, picture from Jan's talk earlier uh, this spring. And in Jan's talk, he focused on the morphology of uh, different uh, vesicles. So we did not only have this round structure, we actually had vesicles that had vesicles in them and long tubes. And he also focused on a certain uh, population of vesicles that have mitochondrial membrane proteins on them. So today I'm going to focus on some of the other subpopulations that we are working with, uh, starting with uh, vesicles with different density and different RNA and DNA cargo. So uh, a few years ago, uh, we had two cell lines. We had the HMC1 and the TF1 cells. Uh, we isolated uh, what we called low density vesicles from around 1.1 to 1.18. And as you can see here, we have vesicles that are around 40 nanometer in size. We have some that are around 80 nanometer, but we also have larger vesicles that are up to 160 nanometer. And when we looked at the RNA profile from these vesicles, we could see that they had the ribosomal RNA peak and this very narrow peak for shorter uh, RNA, so maybe 75 nucleotides. And then we had, we could also isolate high density vesicles that were below uh, 1.2 gram per milliliter. And here we have much more background, but we can see some vesicles here, and they were all around 40 nanometer in size. So uh, this, the, they were much more uniform in, in the size distribution. When we looked at the RNA profile from these, we didn't see the ribosomal RNA peaks, and we saw instead a quite broad um, peak for the short RNAs. So the RNA profiles were substantially different for the low density and the high density vesicles. So next we did a microarray of the RNA from the low density vesicles, the high density vesicles, and the cells. And when we looked at the mRNA, we could see that the mRNA from the high density vesicles did not correlate very well with the cellular mRNA. However, the low density vesicles mRNA correlated very well with the cellular mRNA, as you can see here. And this was also true for the microRNA when we did microarray. The high density vesicle microRNA did not correlate very well with the cellular microRNA, while the low density EV microRNA correlated much better. So we suggested that this could explain some of uh, the previous findings where some people said that their RNA and their vesicles correlated very well with the cellular RNA, and others says, no, my vesicular RNA is not correlated uh, with the cellular RNA. And it could just be that they are looking at different subpopulations or mixture uh, thereof. We also sequenced uh, the RNA from the high density samples, the low density samples, and the cells. And if we're just focusing on you know, comparing the high density and the low density, you can see here are several RNA species and the percentage of the reads that we found on the y axis. And you can see that uh, microRNA, bolt RNA, snow RNA, snRNA are all enriched in the high density vesicles compared to the low density vesicles. On the other hand, tRNA, mitochondrial tRNA, pvRNA, and yRNA are instead enriched in the low density vesicles compared to the high density. So not only are the profiles different when we look in the bioanalysis, but also, uh, and, and besides the microRNA and the mRNA that we could see in the uh, microarray data, we also saw that for these other RNA species, they are different. So next we wanted to know, okay, now we know about the RNA content of different of these two different subpopulations of vesicles, but what about the DNA? And in the 
The study I showed you before, we used a sucrose gradient, density gradient, but for this study, we shifted to uh, the octiprep. So therefore, we wanted to again isolate RNA as well as the DNA to make sure that this, that the profiles that we saw in the previous paper, that we can find them here as well. So we did a density gradient to isolate each fractions. We divided each fractions into two parts and isolated DNA from one of them and RNA from the other one. And what was shown here is that in the low density EVs, we mainly find RNA, which is the blue here. So it's shown as percentage of the total DNA and RNA. So a lot of RNA was found in the low density EVs, but for the high density EVs, we found the majority of the DNA, but also some RNA. So if we look at it uh, for the two different cell lines, we can see that the low density fractions contain more RNA for both cell lines and DNA, while for the high density fractions, the numbers were more similar between the DNA and RNA, but we also saw a difference between the two cell lines, that for the HMC1, it contained more DNA, while for the uh, TF1, it contained more RNA. So again, we have these RNA profiles that I showed you uh, previously, that we have the low density EVs with the ribosomal RNA peaks and the quite narrow uh, peak here around 75 nucleotides. And if we look at DNA in these vesicles, we have very little DNA. In the high density EVs, we have this different RNA profile, which have a broader peak for the short um, RNAs. And this is where we have the majority of the DNA. So we next looked at different markers, uh, previous uh, found EV markers in uh, with Western blot. And we can see that all these markers were present in the low density vesicles, but they are also present in the high density vesicles. And this is for both cell lines. But when we looked at histones, so DNA binding protein, we could only find them in the fractions where the majority of the DNA was found. So next we wanted to determine whether this DNA were on the inside or the outside of the vesicles. So blue here is showing the DNA uh, in the vesicle fractions, and then the gray is shown when we have DNA shredded. So we have fractions, again, we divided them in two, and one we DNA shredded and the other one we did not DNA shred. And then uh, we isolated the DNA from the vesicles to see what has been protected. And as you can see here, in the low density fractions, very little DNA was protected. This is also true for the high density fractions, uh, the majority of the DNA disappear when we DNA street, although more of the DNA was protected in these uh, vesicles, suggesting that the majority of the DNA is uh, on the outside of the vesicles. So next we sequenced uh, all the DNA. So it's actually three samples. So these are all the chromosomes as well as the mitochondrial um, DNA. And we have three samples illustrated here. So it's the total DNA, and it's also the DNA that is left after we have treated with the DNA, so the DNA that are protected on the inside of the vesicles. And as you can see, all chromosomes uh, were present in the EV DNA, and we have especially a lot of mitochondrial uh, DNA. So dark blue means that we have the most uh, uh, of these. And we could also see that, for example, one of the cell lines uh, were from a female donor, and then we didn't find the Y uh, chromosome there. So, so that was uh, reassuring. But it shows that all the chromosomes are covered in the EV-associated DNA. So uh, we have looked a lot of the density and the RNA and the DNA cargo, but uh, other people have uh, looked at density, connected it to size, and looked at the proteins. So uh, this uh, study is from Clotilde Therese's group in Paris, uh, the Clau study from Knaus a few years ago, where they took the 10K pellet and the 100K pellet um, and loaded it on density gradients. And then when 
when they looked at Western blot, they could see that they have two uh, population, one in F3, fraction three, and one in F5. And this was seen both from, for the 10K and the 100K vesicles. And many of the proteins that we previously have suggested to be unique for or enriched in the small EVs were actually also detected in these larger vesicles from the 10K pellet. And I might refer to these as low and high density vesicles, but I just want to highlight that these high density vesicles do not have the same density as our high density vesicles. So after they showed that several of these markers were not unique for uh, either of uh, these subpopulations, they did proteomics and they could suggest some new markers. So for example, ADAM10, symphonin one the uh, EHD4 were suggested to be enriched in the small vesicles, while some of the actinin as well as uh, mutafilin were enriched in the 10K uh, vesicles. So we have also now performed some proteomics on subpopulations of vesicles. So in this study, which was published earlier uh, this year with uh, Rosella as the first author, we have tumor tissue and we isolate vesicles directly from the tumor tissue. So this is melanoma. We then isolate large and small vesicles separately. We load them separately on density gradients. And then we can isolate both low density vesicles from the large and the small vesicles and high density vesicles from the large and the small vesicles. Uh, we did uh, a lot of analysis of these vesicles, but I will only show uh, some of the proteomics data here. So what we did is that we took the top 100 proteins identified from Wikipedia, Exocarta, and Vesicopedia. We put it together to, uh, to a list, removed the duplicates. We also added some of the proteins that were suggested in the Kraval paper. And we wanted to see what does this uh, protein look like in our subpopulations. So first we could see that we had two clusters that were uh, enriched in both the large low density vesicles and the small low density vesicles. So these proteins could not distinguish the large and the small vesicles. Um, they were present in both of them for the, uh, for the low density vesicles. And here, for example, we have several of the RABs, uh, we have flotulin. So these are not markers that could be used to separate the large and the small vesicles. Next, we found uh, one cluster that were enriched only in the small, low density vesicles. And interestingly, this is where we found uh, ADAM10 that um, the Kval paper suggested to be enriched in small, low density vesicles. So we could confirm that. What was interesting was that it was only one protein that were in, uniquely enriched in the large EVs. And this is uh, mitophilin that was also suggested in the Kval paper. And I think this analysis highlights two things. One is that we have several markers that cannot distinguish the large and the small vesicles. And we also have very, very few markers that are unique for the large vesicles. And I think this is due to that the majority of the study so far has only been looking at exosomes, small vesicles, 100K, um, pellet vesicles, and very few have actually compared them or done proteomics on these large vesicles. So this really shows that we're lacking good markers for them. So we wanted uh, to do something about that. Uh, we wanted to identify subpopulation in rich protein that could be a marker for uh, distinguishing large and small EVs. So in this project, we had three cell lines. They are all coming from the uh, breast cancer cell line the same, but they have been generating in different uh, mice. So we do first a spin to get rid of the cells and the um, larger apoptotic bodies and debris. Then we do 16,500 G, and this is what we consider large vesicles. And then we do uh, a 118,000 G spin, which we call the small vesicles. Both the large and the small vesicles were loaded, bottom loaded on a density gradient where we put several layers on top 
and would then spin overnight. And then we looked at all these fractions. So what we could see was that flocculin was detected both in the large and the small vesicles, and it was detected in several fractions. The tetraspan in CD63 and CD81, on the other hand, was enriched in the small vesicles and to lesser extent identified in the large vesicles. And we could also see that their distribution was much more narrow, mainly in fraction two and a little bit in fraction three. We measured particles in all these fractions for both large and small EVs, and we could see that the majority of the particles were present in fraction two. And then when we looked at uh, EM, we could see that the majority of the vesicles, and especially for the small EVs, were present in this fraction two as well. So then I just want to highlight that this fraction two is around 20% of uh, the OptiPrep and around 1.1 um, gram per milliliter in the density. So uh, to simplify things, we then constructed a cushion that is focusing on isolating the vesicles in these fractions. So in this one, we're not comparing high density and low density. Instead, we're trying to compare the uh, large and the small vesicles. So we construct this cushion, we will, which will not spread our vesicles into the whole gradient, but actually focus them very narrow in between here. So we have these uh, cushions and we isolate vesicles and we could see that from the large vesicles, we indeed have larger vesicles when we look at them in EM, and for the small EVs, these are much smaller. When we look at Western blot, we could see that flocculin are present in both the large and the small EVs for all three cell lines, while the uh, tetraspanins are enriched in the small EVs compared to the large EVs for two of the cell lines, where, while we had problem detecting them at all in this third cell line, although you might see a tendency. An explanation for this could be that when we compared both protein and particles, compared how much small vesicles and large vesicles these cells released, we could see that these two cell lines, the BM and the LM, release uh, more uh, small vesicles compared to large vesicles, while this cell line actually released more large vesicles. So this could be an explanation for the differences uh, we see here. So another thing that we found was that since we had the crude pellet of the large and the small vesicles, we could measure the protein and the particles present there. We then loaded that on a cushion, and then we could measure the particles and the proteins that we could get out from the EV enriched uh, part of the cushion. And interestingly, if we look at the recovery of protein, only around 10 to 20 percent of the protein that we actually loaded on the cushion ended up in the EV part, while for the large vesicles, actually 40 to 50 percent could be recovered. So this is highlighting uh, that small EV crude pellets are really contaminated by other soluble proteins. So when you load them on a density gradient or cushion, it might look like your recovery is really going down. But I think that you're really purifying these vesicles, and I think this is highlighting the need to purify your vesicles on a density gradient or cushion before you do proteomic analysis. And this is much more important for the small vesicles, but also for the, for the large vesicles. I think this is important because when we looked at particles, we did not see these strong differences in the recovery. So we finally had our really pure large and small vesicles of the cushion. So we had three cell lines. We had three biological replicates for each EV type. So in total, we had nine large EV samples and nine small EV samples. And we did quantitative proteomics, and we could identify several proteins that were either enriched in large or small EVs. And I want to highlight here that this is relatively enrichment. So it doesn't mean that this protein, we have the most of it in the small EVs. We have, it's mostly enriched compared to the large EVs, so it's a relative um, quantification. So when we looked at the proteins that were enriched in the large EVs, and we looked at geoterms that they were associated with, 
we could see that these proteins were associated with uh, membrane, mitochondrial, ribosome, and endoplasmic reticulum, and the biological functions were then connected to that. So like mitochondrial electron transport, uh, RNA processing, and, 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 and splicing. The proteins that were enriched in the small EVs, on the other hand, were strongly associated with extracellular exosome, plasma membrane. It was also interesting to see the late endosome membrane and endosomal transport, multivesicular body assembly. And this would at least suggest that a part of our small vesicles do have an exosomal origin. So we now have uh, our proteins. And we started by comparing to uh, the Koval paper from the field through this group again from 2016, where you here can see that the proteins that are shown in red is enriched in the small EVs, while the proteins that are shown in green are enriched in the large EVs. So this is the log two fold change between, between these two subpopulations, and the one that are gray are not enriched in either of the subpopulation of vesicles. So we could actually validate it, all the proteins that were suggested in the Caval study, except for the uh, EHC4, which we couldn't see a difference. And then we could also uh, validate the two proteins that they suggested to be enriched in large EVs, the mifepin and the actin-4. And we could also see here that flocculin are not enriched in either of these subpopulations and might work as a good general EV marker, but cannot be used as a marker to distinguish uh, these two. And this was no surprise based on what we've seen on the Western blocks before uh, we did uh, the, the proteomics. So we saw that syntonin 1 was really enriched in small vesicles compared to the large vesicles. And another study has suggested that syntonin 1 together Lucidicin 4 and Alex are uh, involved in the exosome biogenesis. We can actually see that all three of these proteins were highly enriched in the small vesicles. So next we wanted to see, since we know that tetraspanins are enriched, we actually wanted to see all tetraspanins. So this is not just the tetraspanins that is upregulated, it's actually all the tetraspanins that we could identify in our data set. And here you see that they are all enriched in the small vesicles compared to the large vesicles. And it was also interesting to see that some of these um, maybe less known tetraspanins, like tetraspanin 4, 5, 6, were actually more enriched than the more commonly used markers such as CD9, CD63, and CD81. And it could be interesting maybe in the future to also use these as marker. And it's also interesting to know that ADAM10 is actually um, co-localizing with many of these tetraspanins. So they have a close link. So we also looked at all the ADAMs and all the ADAM TES that we can could quantify in our uh, data set. So ADAMs are a membrane-bound enzyme that cleaves off the extracellular part of proteins. So it can regulate cell signaling, cell adhesion, and things like that. And the ADAM-TS have similar uh, functions, but the majority of these are not membrane bound. And uh, they are um, cleaving off a lot of proteins in the extracellular matrix. And interestingly, we could see that except for one, all of these were enriched in the small vesicles. Next, I just want to highlight that all Although tetraspanins are highly enriched in the small vesicles compared to the large vesicles, it has been suggested by the Koval paper as well that not all tetraspanins are on the same vesicles. So here they actually used different feeds with antibodies for CD81, CD63, and CD9 to capture uh, these different subtypes of vesicles. They did a proteomic analysis and they could see that CD9 vesicle seems to be quite different from the CD63 and CD81 vesicle, suggesting that these might not be on the same vesicle or come from the same um, biogenesis. So this is um, our data as well, uh, but it's not the, the data set I've just shown. This is plasma serum vesicles. 
So we published a few years ago with, uh, with Nassim Karimi, a postdoc, as the first author of this paper. Uh, we published where we showed that we could isolate vesicles from a plasma based on a combination on density cushion and size exclusion chromatography. We have now continued with this work, and here I'm showing some exoview data. So it's a really sophisticated chip that has spots with different antibodies on. So you would capture vesicles based on these antibodies, and then you can actually detect them with these. So it's like a sandwich uh, ELISA, but a little bit more uh, sophisticated. And what we saw for both serum and plasma is that when we capture with CD81, we see very little CD63. When we capture with CD63, we see very little CD81. And this we see both for the serum and the plasma. Well, if we look at cell line derived vesicles, we don't see this pattern. And this is just another way of showing it that when we're capturing with CD81, we find very little uh, CD63. And when we capture with CD63, we find very little CD81. And interestingly, when we capture with CD41A, which is a platelet marker, we mainly find CD9 on these vesicles. So this suggests that CD63, CD81, and CD9 might be on different subpopulations of vesicles in plasma and serum. And we could validate this by uh, adding beads that have either CD, anti CD81, CD63, or CD9 on them, and then run them with flow cytometry and stain them and look. And if we start looking at the CD81 beads, we have the green CD81 signal, but we don't have any CD63, which is the red signal. If we capture with CD63 beads, we have both red and blue, so that's CD9 and CD63, but we don't have any CD81. If we capture with CD9, we have all three signals. We have CD9, CD63, and CD81, but it's also evident that few vesicles are CD81 positive in, in the plasma serum. So going back to the data set that I was talking about before, where we have three breast cancer cell line, we now looked at the escort proteins because the escort machinery has been suggested to be part of the biogenesis of exosomes. And when we looked at them, the majority of these proteins were enriched in the small vesicles compared to the large vesicles. So what about the large vesicles then? Less is known about their biogenesis. We know that they are budding off the plasma membrane, but which proteins are involved is less known. We found uh, three studies that suggested couple of proteins that might be involved, and they were mainly associated with calcium influx, phospholipid dynamics, and cytoskeletal remodeling. But we could actually see that the majority of these proteins were either not enriched in either of the subpopulations or enriched in the small vesicles. So very few of these were actually enriched in the large EVs. And here I just want to highlight that Although a protein is not enriched in a subpopulation, it doesn't mean it's not part of their biogenesis, but it's, it's at least a suggestion that these proteins are not uh, following along into the, to the vesicles and, and might not be good markers. So I said before that few studies have actually compared large uh, and small vesicle in proteomics, but there are actually a couple of them that have done that. And here we can see all the proteins that they suggested to be upregulated in the large vesicles compared to the small vesicles. And which was really, um, really nice to see is that we can actually validate uh, the majority of these proteins to be upregulated in the large vesicles. So maybe we have some new markers here that can be suggested. Some of these have been identified just in one of the studies. Some of them have been identified in several. So uh, to conclude, we have several subpopulations of EVs, and you might have some vesicles that are released that have the same biogenesis, but then they have different morphology. They might have different 
uh, surface markers, but might end up on the same density. And I'm really excited about that. I think this is being like a detective and you're trying to figure out that, okay, I see this pattern for my density vesicles, but some other published similar, but they look at size or morphology and, and you can kind of put the puzzle together on, on, on what these different subpopulations are. So I'm really excited, but I, I admit that it sometimes feels like this. And, and it's, it's hard to, to, to fit them all together. But uh, why are we so interested in subpopulation and why is it important? Well, if one cell release vesicles that have a positive regulation on the recipient cell and a subpopulation that have a negative regulation, if you isolate them as a mixture, you might not see any effect on the recipient cell. And you might say, vesicles from cell A doesn't affect anything in cell B, and that might actually uh, not be correct. I'm also thinking that if you're interested in biomarkers, if I think that maybe this subpopulation would be more interesting because the mRNA that is really high in the tumor cell, for example, is also high in the vesicle, while this subpopulation might be less good as a biomarker because it seems a little bit more um, different on how these RNAs are loaded. But for example, maybe this subpopulation is better for emptying the RNA and load it with some therapeutic drugs. So I really think we have to, to be aware of which subpopulations we're working with. So in conclusion, there are many different types of EVs being released by a single cell type, and we can describe them in terms of density, molecular cargos, and morphology. It's really important to separate them in our analysis because we might miss functions otherwise or not find potential biomarkers. I'm always fascinating with people who are interested in biomarker and they throw the 10K pellet away and just look at the 100K. And I'm thinking if you're interested in a biomarker, you should check all the vesicles because you don't know where it is and you might miss it otherwise. And I also think it's important to identify new markers so that we actually can separate the subpopulation and we actually know what it is that we are analyzing, if it's a function or, or something else. And as Jan mentioned, um, both me and Carolina has been involved in producing two MOOCs, so massive open online courses. Uh, of course, the entire EV community was involved. Many people uh, contributed to lectures. So if you haven't checked those two MOOCs out, or you have maybe a new student who wants to learn more, I would really recommend uh, checking these two MOOCs out. And of course, I did not produce all this data by myself. We have a really great team at the Kirkland Research Center in uh, the University of Gothenburg but we also have great uh, collaborations. So uh, thanks to everybody contributing and thank you for your attention. Mute, unmute, there we go. Thank you very much, Carolina. So uh, uh, yeah, it was interesting to- Should I stop to, uh, share, to, to, Gilliam? I mean. <laughs> you can stop share, you can stop share. Um, see our data being presented to an outside audience like that. It's uh, very detailed, thank you. Uh, so please put your questions in the chat box uh, and I will um, let you ask your question and ask you to unmute. So Clotilde is the first one to ask, ask a question. Clotilde Terry, please unmute yourself. Yes, well. Hello. Well, thanks very much, Cecilia, for this uh, great talk. Uh, well, as you probably know, we are exactly on the same line. I mean, I'm exactly, I mean, your conclusion is really the same as I'm, I'm also proposing. So it's really important that, that you also share this view that it's important to uh, analyze the different subtypes of EVs and, and uh, consider that there are so many different ones. So, well, to, to be brief, I had one first question about the DNA study. And I, uh, so in, in one of the slides you show that in your two cell lines, one of them had more DNA in the EVs, uh, especially the high density EVs, if I remember well, than the other one. And it was the mastocyte cell line um, that had more DNA, if I'm not mistaken. And I was wondering whether this could be due uh, 
whether you had induced the, the secretion of EVs by this mastocyte cell line by a stimulus, which is generally used for mastocytes, and that could have induced maybe more cell deaths or maybe a new process that would uh, account for this additional amount of DNA. Yeah, so uh, no, we didn't induce any release of vesicles from any of these okay. cell lines. And what we actually can see is that this TF1 cell line in our hands released tons of vesicles and it has a lot of RNA and DNA in it. So we have much more of these in, in vesicles from that cell line or associated vesicles from that cell line than the HMC. Once we see a difference between the two cell lines and we did measure uh, uh, apoptose, or we measured uh, viability in the cells, and for those cell lines, it's, it's above 95%. Of course, 5% dead cells okay. can contribute DNA, but it wasn't a big difference between the two cell lines. But isn't the HMC1 okay. like 99% viability? Yeah, I mean, they, they are really, really happy. So yes, the, the, the TF1 have maybe 95, but... Um, but we see generally that that cell line it's, produces a lot of vesicles. Can, can, I, can I follow up that question? So you find the nucleotides primarily in the higher density of vesicles. Could the nucleotides by themselves contribute to the density? So the, they end up in, with a high density fraction because they carry these, these nucleotides. Yeah, I mean, I usually view you have low density vesicles and high density vesicles. And it really correlates that pure lipids has below one, pure RNA, pure protein, pure DNA have somewhere 1.4. And then you have the vesicles like within the spectra. And I think it might be due to the amount or the ratio between the RNA, the proteins and lipids. It really is reflecting where they are in the gradients. You think that's important Clotilde? What, the density or? Yeah, that the, the amount of nucleotides in each vesicle influences its density. Well, yeah, I think the density uh, is, is uh, well, as uh, Cecilia said, the density by itself is not a definition because it can be influenced by indeed the nucleotides and the ratio of nucleotides to lipids. And well, we don't know how this is controlled. But yeah, I mean, I mean all, I also, <laughs> all this. Uh, Clotilde? Yeah, I also remember when I started uh, doing the gradient, uh, Wilhelm Storfogel always told me you have to do 72 hours because if you do shorter gradients, the vesicles might not actually have reached their final true density. But I think we at the time were interested in separating them. So this worked for us. So you also have to think about like how long do you do your gradient and do they really reach their final um, uh, this density because uh, William Storfogel's group suggests yeah. that you have like slow moving vesicles and fast. Yeah, but could, well, could they change their phenotype during the centrifugation process and lose some content? Yeah, this is hard. Well, <laughs> Let's not dig into this. We're doing what is reasonable, right? Currently. <laughs> The current know-how. So. so, and actually, to come, and actually to come back with with well, your comment on the the, the t time of uh, centrifugation, there was this this work by uh, Palma was the first author in 2012, where they they did this what they call buoyant density uh, gradient, where they indeed separated the EVs after different times of centrifugations, and they showed the microRNAs were uh, indeed present in in. Uh, uh, different subtypes of EVs. I, if no, you're not aware of this work, it was done uh, in particular with MDA and B231, so it may be of interest for your last uh, yeah. photomic study. I'll send it to you afterwards. Uh, and just yep. very quickly for the photomic study, so I, I was very, uh, I, I was actually even surprised that you found so much so good correlation between your MDA and B23 and proteomics and our dendritic cell proteomics because I I was expecting cells to be more or more different, but it was nice to see that you had so much correlation. For the escort, the escort, they are involved in formation of vesicles in MVBs, but also at the plasma membrane. So I don't yes. think that this, they are a signature of, of exosomes or anything. And um, 
And we are also analyzing MDA, MB231 a lot, but only the regular ones, not, uh, not the two uh, other subtypes that we have analyzed. And we don't have that much uh, large vesicles, but maybe it's because uh, we don't spin as, at the same speed. So I was wondering how in this protomic you, you uh, could account, the quantification could take into account potential different amounts of total uh, material recovered uh, in the large EVs versus the small EVs. So that, that was a complication for us always. Yeah, I mean, it's always like, what do you normalize on? Do you start with the same number of cells, take isolate the vesicles and take kind of everything or volume based or something. What we do is that we try to start with enough material so we always have enough material in the end. And when we send to proteomics, we send the same amount of proteins. So we normalize on that because otherwise if one subpopulation have more protein, everything is gonna be upregulated in that one. So we normalize based, based on protein. But okay. what, what, okay, what yeah. we saw is that these three cell lines, as I said, one of them actually released more large vesicles than small, and the other one released more small. So you also have the difference between cell lines. Okay, thank you. We move on to uh, Kyoto Kashiba. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, thank you very much. Very uh, beautiful walks. And I was interested in the, your uh, RNA data and uh, uh, so it looks like uh, low density uh, SEV uh, has a ribosome RNA, but uh, high density ribosome uh, SEV didn't have a ribosome RNA. So, do you usually uh, find uh, find the ribosome RNA from a small EV, or was that specific to the cell line uh, you used? No, we actually see this. We have uh, seen that in several. So uh, our previous PhD student, Tara Luna Vak in the group, have studied other cell lines, see similar mm -hmm. things, uh, uh -huh. that we can find the ribosomal RNA peak. So uh, we also see, I didn't show that, but from the tissue derived vesicles, we see the similar trend. So we really mm -hmm. see this and we, we can, and, and as, as we see, they, they float well in the gradient as well, so it doesn't seem like they are mm -hmm. random uh, things. Um, so yes, we do see this, and I would like to point out that we cannot say that we don't have ribosomal RNA in the, in the high-density vesicles, but we don't see the peaks for it mm -hmm. in, the, in the bionlyzer, but it could mm -hmm. be degraded, could be present in this. So did you, find, uh, did you find the ribosomal, ribosomal protein uh, from uh, proteomic analysis? Yes, we find a lot of ribosomal proteins. Uh -huh. I see. I'll, I'll be you. honest with you, the, the ribosomal proteins was one of the first discoveries we did when we studied extracellular vesicles 15 years ago. That's we, why we were looking for RNA in the exosomes uh -huh. in 2005, uh, discovered them and published our paper in Nature Cell Biology in 2007. It was based on proteomics initially. So, so thank you very much for those questions. So we move over to Adilson Teixeira. Um, please unmute yourself and ask your question. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lesser. Uh, I have a probably very basic question. Uh, do, you have, do you think we have a, a solid basis of evidence to consider that uh, cancer cells or other pathological cells may be um, imbalanced um, towards the secretion of a particular subpopulation of extracellular vesicles um, by secreting more uh, small extracellular vesicles or more large extracellular vesicles. And, and uh, if, uh, if we, we have, um, could you uh, um, see a clear benefit to, uh, to, to, to that reason to uh, why this phenotypic change uh, it's observed in cancer cells or could be observed in cancer cells. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. And I didn't mention it here, but the D3H1 cell line, which release more large vesicles than small vesicles, is a low metastatic cell line. And the two other, the LN and the BM, that release more small vesicles than large vesicles, are highly metastatic. I didn't draw the conclusion here because 
it's just free cell lines, but it could indicate that when the cells become more highly metastatic, they release more small vesicles than large vesicles, at least in this breast cancer model. Uh, so that could definitely be something that is shifting uh, during, for example, uh, tumor cells becoming more metastatic. And I guess it all depends on, on the function, if it's beneficial for them, uh, whatever these small vesicles are doing, that they shift and release more of them. Okay, you. Carolina, you had a question. Unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, thank you. But it's actually, uh, Jan, you already asked that question about uh, so all whether, the smaller ones are <laughs> yeah, possible. whether you have a, a clue about what caused the difference of the densities in the small EV population. So I think, uh, I guess I just want to ask, expand a little bit about that, uh, whether you, you uh, can tell us about the percentage of the low density versus uh, high density in the SEV. Is, do, you, do you have a clue about, you know, um, the compositions, like which one is higher and so on? Oh, you mean uh, which one we have the most of? Mm, which one is most, like, is it more uh, low density or is it more high density? Or is there a difference with the tumor cells and maybe different source? Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of all the data <laughs> we have collected throughout <laughs> the years. Uh, I know, for example, that when we measure particles, we see much, much more particles in the low density. But with that said, we also see that the high density are smaller. So maybe they are too small for the NTA for the tech, for example. So you always have that question mark that if you see more of something, is it uh, with, with small, is the method good enough to detect? Is that, is that sort of like 50 nanometers, you think, like high density? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I mean, we see that they are like 40 with EM. So I, I would assume that they will not be very good measured with NTA, which might have a, you know, the limitation slightly above that. Um, so it's hard to say. Um, I can't say that we have like a percentage, say, unless... Um, Elisa remember or Rosella remember it differently, but on the top of my head, I don't think we have really done that comparison. We have looked at the amount of RNA and the amount of DNA and the amount of proteins, but if that is really a true measurement of these cycles, I guess can be discussed. So we move over to Daniel. Um, please unmute yourself and ask a question. Yes, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Uh, um, I was wondering if, if you think that this heterogeneity in DV subpopulation can affect the comparison uh, of the results emerged from different studies. I mean, if the subpopulation uh, <clears throat> are influenced by the technique, the, the isolation technique used, it will be possible to compare uh, um, the result with different uh, papers that use different techniques. Yeah, I mean, I think for sure that uh, size exclusion chromatography will enrich for one type of vesicles, while the density gradients will enrich for something else, and all the other techniques. So yes, I think that is a problem that we sometimes don't have a good knowing on how these are connected, but I think that we t together can make that possible. Uh, that if I see a certain RNA profile in my low density vesicles, and then you see that in a sec fraction, maybe we can start figuring out that whatever is floating at this density seems to end up here in this technique. But yeah, it's, it's a challenge with, with the different techniques and they're most likely enriched for different subpopulations for sure. And one thing we have to remember as well is that we're studying one single cell type, right? and compare with another type of cell. But in the body, we have multiple types of cells that are in different phenotypical stages and that may create a diversity of vesicles that is uh, tremendous. And, but I think it's interesting. Of course. Can we move to okay. Anna Paulina, please? Unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi. Um... Maybe very basic this question, but I was wondering if uh, there is a difference in loading um, 
at the top in the density gradient at the top or at the bottom uh, it's at the yes so uh, the, uh, yes the short answer is yes there is a difference um, and I think again Wilhelm Stoffel and group have, have done a lot on that and also I think Esther Nolte Hohen worked on that uh, and compare and <clears throat> so the vesicles might take different time reaching the a certain fraction depending if you top or bottom load but i also think the most important for the bottom loaded which we always always aim to do but it of course depends on the volume of your sample if you have the possibility to load it in the bottom but if you load in the bottom the vesicles would float up and the proteins will stay in the bottom if you top load your vesicles would float down to the density but you might have a bigger contamination of of the soluble proteins. So for that reason, we always try to bottom load. And we did some comparison in the RNA paper from 2017, where we both top loaded and bottom loaded. And we saw in the end, they ended up in similar fractions. It was a small difference, but similar. So yes, there's, there's a difference. And I think bottom loaded from a protein point of view is preferable. Mm, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, if you want to say floating, you have to put it on the bottom and then they float up, right? Otherwise, yeah. it's density. Yeah. Yeah. Hernando. yeah, I mean. Hernando, please unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, thanks there a lot, Cecilia, for the talk. And thank you for sharing and publish results. Uh, uh, the question that I have is whether or not in these very highly pure preparations of EVs, you have continued your work on the excellent characterization of RNA. In particular, I'm really curious about the long non-coding RNAs because in the initial publications, they were not mentioned and they are now taking a lot of importance, you know, in terms of regulation, you know, in terms of cancer, inflammatory diseases. So I'm wondering if, if you have further characterized this in these highly pure preparations. Um, not, not in this final study, no. Uh, so far, we have focused on the, the proteins but I'm interested in looking at the RNAs for sure. I'm interested in looking at the lipids also. So it's, um, it's definitely something we might do, but I don't have an answer for that. Right no, now. this is uh, it's curiosity because these long non coding yeah. RNAs are also calling our attention. I mean, really, they are so abundant and, and apparently, you know, within EVs, they really seem to have a very, very, very interesting functional role. So thank you mm -hmm. for the talk and thank you for the answer, okay? Maybe we should have a special um, presentation on that sometime. I would be fantastic, Jan. I think this yeah. is common, fanta a fantastic topic, really. So we switch to Swarupa. Uh, please unmute yourself and uh, ask your thank question. Thank you for your insights, Dr. Cecilia. So I am, I'm a student from India. I'm doing my master's now. So I just came across, I started working in this TV for about four months ago. So um, during writing the review, I was uh, seeing, uh, I, I came across this, across this statement. So I had a doubt in the basics of the nomenclature of uh, EVs. That is, the, we currently use the nomenclature of microvesicles and exosomes. So um, this statement says that the T cells have, uh, they have shown to primarily produce EVs with exosome characters by budding out of the endosome-like uh, domains from the plasma membrane. So we see that uh, exosomes, usually the vesicles with exosomal characters, they come out of uh, MVBs and they fuse with the membrane and come out. But uh, does T cells show a different uh, kind of a biogenesis pathway compared to micro vesicles? And is the nomenclature still doubtful or is it going through a process of uh, evolution? I just want some insights on it. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, Congratulations well, to that question. That's one of the toughest questions we have in the whole field is to decide what to call these things. So yeah. it's uh, <laughs> something we should come back to Clotilde as well as a, as a society, I guess, for ICEF. Cecilia. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say firstly, welcome uh, to a very exciting uh, field, uh, but also maybe I wouldn't say a confusing field, but uh, we have some challenges still. I think the, the problem, or the challenge is that the, uh, the nomenclature is based on biogenesis. But when we isolate our vesicles, we have no clue where they come from, unless you have like a 
microscope and a pipette and you see the vesicle budding off or you see the multivesicular body fuse and you actually take those vesicles and do an analysis, what we're doing is that we, we don't know. So, I mean, I, I might suggest that my small vesicles are the exosomes and the large vesicles are my free vesicles, but I don't know. Uh, so I think that's the challenge with the nomenclature. It, it, it totally makes sense, but it's hard in practice to, to, to uh, separate these vesicles. I, I totally so, agree uh, with that. Uh, one, one quick sorry. comment uh, is that if, if you look at most cells, multivesicular bodies, they carry uh, normally small vesicles primarily, right? And uh, whereas some cells can have larger vesicles in the multivesicular bodies as well. And that could be an indication that perhaps the small ones actually do come from the multivesicular bodies. Uh, please come back to uh, Swarup, I'll come back to your question. Yeah, uh, so uh, currently the uh, research uh, on uh, exosomes and other vesicles, these uh, extracellular vesicles from uh, gamma delta pieces has been uh, very, it, it's, it's very young to research. On. So uh, do you think uh, this kind of research can be further established on those gamma delta cells? Is there any scope for it? Yes, I mean, I think we should study the vesicles from all cells and what they're doing, okay. so for sure. Uh, but I think we kind of have surrogates for, for the biogenesis. We isolate them based on size or G forces or density, and, and that's just our way of dividing them when it's hard for us to know which true biogenesis they'll have. I think this is a very just, interesting question that I am, I am trying to figure out myself as well. And that is how, to which extent do activated or unactivated T cells of different types release vesicles and take up vesicles. Even in our very early study, we saw quite little uptake by T cells, some uptake, but not so much. So if there's anybody here that can comment on the degree by which T cells, maybe you can, you can comment on that Swarupa if you're working with the T cells. Yeah, we uh, have been trying to uh, do some, uh, I mean, we have been trying to do a project on it. Uh, that is uh, extracellular vesicles from these gamma delta pieces and using them for uh, isolating them, characterizing them first. And then uh, we use them for uh, cancer cell lines, trying to express uh, the gamma delta receptors of the T cells on the exosome surface. So that's what we've been trying to do. So we've just started it initially. I just want I mean, to I mean, Clotilde has done some work on, I think it's the dendritic vesicles, but giving them to T cells and see different like Th1 and Th2 response, depending on if yes. it's the large vesicle or the small or the middle size, the 10K, 100K, 2000. Uh, just a, uh, one more question on your topic. Uh, okay, this is the final one and then we should conclude. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, the different RNA populations, we see that some of the RNAs of the parent cell, they are being expressed in uh, the uh, microvesicles. And in some other uh, subpopulations, we see that it's not the exact correlation. So uh, does that mean that, uh, so we have come across some motive sequences in these RNAs, which uh, act as signals for those RNAs to get uh, loaded into these vesicles. So is there any other mechanism which uh, tells how these uh, different kinds of mRNAs get selectively sorted? Yeah, I mean, as you said, I know there are studies out there looking at different um, RNA uh, binding proteins and the motifs that might drive this. Uh, I'm no expert on it, uh, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are different ways of getting the RNA into the to the vesicles that we're yet not aware of and some we are just starting to discover. Yeah, this is uh, an active yeah, research field for some people. I think we shall uh, shall conclude the discussion here. It was great. Thank you everyone. And we give you I give the word to Carolina. So get my G again. So please Carolina uh, thank you, remind yeah. us about next week and so on. Yeah, uh, and uh, thank you so much, Cecilia. Great talk. And I think that was a very wonderful uh, biochemistry analysis that you shows about uh, and then comparison between low density, high density in small EVs and also on the markers uh, in uh, small EV versus large EV. Yes, thanks so much for sharing all that new data that we can learn so much from it. <laughs>